So today we're going to talk about the what? The ram. The ram. So what, does God really care about animals? Three people are, yeah, of course he does. He cares about animals. Is he providentially in control of animals? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's in, he's in control of everything. Uh, the book of Job, chapter 37, uh, verse 15, there's a rhetorical question. Uh, here's the rhetorical question. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes lightning? Mm, well, I'm sure there's some scientists who know, but the typical person, I don't know. You know, he, he controls the movement of a cloud across the surface of the planet. He, it's that important to him. So if he's controlling clouds and lightning wherever the strikes are, he's probably concerned about every else, uh, animals, etc. Jonah chapter 1 is a case in point. I believe my case for God being concerned about animals. Uh, Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 Jonah, you know, is fleeing from God, uh, and uh, they throw him overboard because he's, he's the one that's bringing the storm upon them in the little boat about to sink, uh, and so they cast lots. A lot falls upon him. He confesses, I've been running from God. They're like, what are you thinking? They throw him overboard, uh, and it says in verse 17, and the Lord appointed a great fish. The Hebrew word is dag. That's not a whale. It's just a big fish. It must have been a really big fish, or Jonah was very small, um, I'm just saying, a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. Heading which direction? Well, we've talked about this a couple weeks ago. He's heading, he's going east. He's, first he's going west towards Spain. Now he's going east back toward Israel. And the fish spits him out on the land. And he, he's under full orders. Go to Nineveh, the Assyrians, and, and preach the word of God to them. Like I told you to do. Uh, who controlled the fish? God did. Have you ever been fishing and you're not catching anything? And you've had one of those theological moments. I've had these, many of these, because I like to fish. God, this entire ocean is yours. And there must be thousands of fish swimming around my boat. Could you just make one bite my line? <laughs> Guess what? Does God answer that prayer when I'm fishing? Not usually. Fishing to me is a spiritual maturation thing. You know, bring my line up, nothing, you know. One of my friends who was a pastor was so desperate on the way home, he stopped at a Safeway and bought a bunch of fish. And his wife's like, you caught all these? Well, not really. <laughs> caught them at Safeway. Uh, God controls the fish. So does God care about the animals that are in the, uh, the, the stable? Absolutely. They wouldn't just be there by accident. Especially when you bring in the Messiah here, his son. God's going to make sure that there's certain kinds of animals there. So I think that the ram would be there. And I'm going to show you why I think the ram would be there based on these two chapters. Genesis 15 and Genesis chapter 22. So the sermon will be divided between those two chapters. Uh, and we want to first look at what's the message about this ram from the first usage of the word ram in the Old Testament. That's going to be in Genesis 15. So let's look at that. First usage of the word ram in the Old Testament. Verse 1 of chapter 15. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Quote, don't fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. And Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? God, you, you called me in chapter 12 to leave Ur the Chaldees, which is over there. You know, I don't know how you know geography, but if you take the Persian Gulf, it's kind of like, a, like, a, like an insect with antenna. And the antenna coming out of its head uh, would be the Euphrates and the Tigris. And the way you remember the order is the movie E.T. I'm just saying. Geography 101. The bug is the Euphrates. The antenna are Euphrates Tigris. And Abraham left that. He, he came out to be the man who did God's will to be part of the Abrahamic covenant. He, he, but he's getting in his 80s and he's like got no son. He goes, you know, God, if you want to make me a great nation, there's kind of a problem. I'm over 80, so, and my wife is too. And uh, since I don't have a son, I have a servant named Eliezer in the cultural Mideastern uh uh, complexes, if you, if you don't have a progenitor, uh, you give that to your trusted servant. Is it Eliezer? Is he the trusted son? What's God say? He says, you've given me no offspring born in my house as an heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man, Eliezer, will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And, and he took him outside, God did, and he told him, now look to the heavens and count the stars. You can imagine an 80-something year old man Okay, got one, two, three. He says, if you're able to count them, he says, that's going to be your progenitors. He says to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he, uh, Abraham, believed the Lord, even in his 80s, and he reckoned that unto him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. Abraham uh, 
wondered as anybody would in their 80s, God, uh, you gave me a promise to make me a mighty nation, to get, give us land and to bless us as a nation, and, uh, and, I, and I need a son in order for that to happen. You know, most people have their children in what age range? 20s to 30s, 40s. Who's planning at like 85? You know, honey, why don't we burn her? Huh? There is no way. You're not thinking about that. You're just glad you're a grandparent, you have grandchildren, and you can buy them cool stuff and leave, and hey, <laughs> I know I'm a grandparent, so you don't have to think about uh, the discipline and the issues, and it's so much easier when you're a grandparent. You're just white-haired. It's just, you know. And so he's saying, God, I need a son. I mean, you better hurry up. Uh, Sarah and I, we're not getting any younger. And in verse, when you read this passage, verse 8, and he says, Oh Lord, how might I know that I shall possess it? I mean, how do I know this land you're giving me and my descendants is like mine for sure, since I don't have a son? Verse 9, God stated to him, Bring me a, a three year old heifer, a three year old female goat, and a what? And a three year old ram. God's very specific. And. Oh, there's the dove and a turtle dove. We'll come back to that later. I mean, like next week. Uh, and a young pigeon. Uh, and then he brought all these to him and he cut them in two and he laid each of them half opposite the other. And he, he did not cut the birds. And then it's, this is the sacrifice. He says, I'll show you how you know you're going to get the land to become a great man uh, of the Israelite nation and the Messiah will come through your loins. I'll, I'll show you how you know that for sure. Uh, we're going to formal, formalize the Abrahamic covenant today. Give me the animals. Make sure there's a ram there. Verse 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Now, the last time a deep sleep fell upon a man was Adam. And what happened when he went to sleep? He lost the rib. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're the Old Testament. Yeah. He thought, man, be very careful when you go to sleep. That's when God does amazing things. Uh, he formed a woman. Amazing. So all of a sudden you have that same motif going on. God must be going to do something great here when he puts Adam in this, uh, you know, dream stupor. Uh, he, 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 then God shows up. So deeply fell upon a uh, Abram. Uh, and behold, there was terror and great darkness fell on him. Why? Because God's going to show up. I mean, if God ever showed up in your life like this, you wouldn't be going, hey, that's cool. Terror. It's God. Fear, reverential fear. And it came about when the sun was set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these two pieces. This is God. I mean, he's, a, he's like fire floating through the air. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I, will, I have given this land from the river Egypt as far as the great river Euphrates. Israel, as God's chosen people, still awaits the day that they have all of that. They've never possessed it uh, eternally. They await the arrival of the Messiah the next time to get it. But God says, this is the covenant, and I'm going to make it with you, and I'm going to make this deal dependent totally on me. Now, if you read Genesis, uh, Je Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 18, you will realize when they made a covenant, uh, and to make a covenant, uh, it was the word for making a covenant was called uh, karat, which means to cut a covenant. It's like cutting something. And it's based on this notion. When you and your partner got together to cut a covenant, make a deal, contract, you got sacrificial animals together, you cut them in half, you split the bodies, and you two walked in between them for one reason. You're telling the other guy, if I am not good for whatever, well, then might I be killed like the animals were killed. Aren't you glad when you bought your house, this was not the way that the <laughs> lender operated, you know? And this is what it was. So God says, Abraham, I'm going to give you the Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to bless you. You're going to bless the world. The Messiah will come through your loins. You're going to become a father of a great nation, Israel. But the whole covenant is on me. Because he doesn't let Abraham walk through the components of the sacrifices. And what was one of the sacrifices? A ram. Why is that appropriate for Jesus? Well, Jesus is the one who came, born in that stable, to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. He's the only one who could fulfill it by being the Messiah. Ram, not there by accident. He, that little ram pointed to the Jesus in the stable who would not just be the deliverer uh, and savior of the world, but who would be the king of kings and fulfill the covenant and control the land. Second thing, message and meaning from the second usage in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 contextually happens many years after chapter 15, and, and, and uh, Ab Abraham has you know, been waiting for this promised son, uh, and he makes some uh, missteps along the way. He, 
He does some major sinful actions along the way. While he's waiting for God to fulfill his word, and he's not producing the child, and he's heading toward 100, uh, his wife comes to him and, and, and tells him, why don't you take my, my uh, servant, Hagar, and, and produce the promised child through her? He said, okay. They produced the child. His name? Ishmael. He was not the promised child. And so that, there's a whole episode of his dysfunction and the sin that was involved and not listening for God to give you the promised child. And so he, he also has other uh, problems in his, uh, his, his spiritual uh, uh, character. He has a, has a penchant for deception and lying. And if you read through the accounts uh, that happen after chapter 15, uh, he, his go-to sin is, is deception, which is really awesome when you think about it because God uses dysfunctional people. Not that there's any here. He uses dysfunctional people. Abraham, the great man of faith, had dysfunction. I mean, he had sin in his life, and God still used him because at moments of his life, he evidenced great faith in following God. So I don't know where you're at this, this uh, Christmas. If there's dysfunction in your life uh, and your self-esteem is low, God's speaking from heaven to saying, hey, that's exactly who I use to accomplish my purposes. So let's look at chapter 22 where God is going to test his dysfunctional servant to take him to a different place, spiritually speaking. And we're going to look at this, uh, this story, the form of it. We're going to break up the, the, the structure of it in, in a two movements. We're going to look at uh, the story's construction as we look at it as a narrative literature. And then we're going to come back and look at the, the story's instruction. So we're going to look first at the story's construction and divide it based on its form uh, on some words that start with the letter R. So in verses 1 to 2, we see a, a request from God. Here's the request. Now, it came about after these things his dysfunction, that God did what to Abraham? He was going to test him. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God's going to test him. What's the difference between how the devil deals with you and how the Lord deals with you? Well, the devil uses the other T word. It's a temptation. He brings things to you to get you to shipwreck your faith, to walk away from God. Now, the, the Lord comes to you. He comes to test you, to make you better, to make you deeper, to mature you. He's going to test you. He comes to his uh, servant, uh, Abraham, who's uh, approaching 100 years old, and he's, he's going to deepen his faith with a, a test of all tests that he's never faced before. You know, when you're 20 years old as a Christian, uh, God will test you. And when you're 50, he will test you. And you would think as you head to 60 and 70, well, you know, I had those years of testing, but I finally arrived spiritually, and I don't need that anymore. Well, then he tests you because of your pride. And he continually tests you. And then when you get 100, you would think, I'm just ready to see Jesus. No, no, you're not ready. He's, he's got to work in your life some more, so he's going to test you even more. Because he's more concerned with your holiness than your happiness. He wants you to be holy. He will drive out those things that are not holy out of your life, and he will put in you in situations to test you. So he's going to take the most loved thing in, in uh, Abraham's life, his son Isaac, the promised child, born in his old age, and he's going to ask him to do something with that child that's off the grid. That's going to change him forever as a man. And he's heard these words before. He's going to tell him in verse 2. Notice what he tells him to do. And imagine if you're Abraham, you know, around 100 years old. You got the promised child, Isaac, whose name means laughter. Because wouldn't you name your child Isaac laughter if God told you at, at 100 you're going to have a child? Wouldn't you laugh? God, are you kidding? Have you seen what I look like now? A child? Have you considered my wife? I mean, women don't give birth like in their 80s. God, have you considered? So they both laughed when they heard the news. And, uh, and God said, I want you to do something with this promised child. Verse 2, notice what God says. Take your own son. Okay, God, that's good so far. Your only son. Yeah, that's right. I just, he's, the, he's the promised child. Whom you love. Oh, I love him. Oh, yeah, Isaac. Yes, you got that right, God. His name's Isaac. Laughter. And go to the land of Moriah. Yeah, I know where that's at. Offer him there as a burnt offering. On one of the mountains, I'm going to show you. Huh? You want to do what? You, you asking me to do what with who? God, are you thinking about this? The Canaanites are into the sacrifice like this. Not you. You want, you want me to do what? Have you ever had an argument with God? See, everybody in every service gets all quiet. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. Yeah, I've, I've argued with God. When I was younger, I would argue to debate God to win. That does not work. It doesn't work. Have God, have you considered A, B, C, and your alternatives are all, no, no, no. It doesn't work. Now that I'm older, I argue to learn. 
God, I consider. I don't understand this, but can you teach me? See, you would, you would think if you were uh, Abraham, you would have a whole lot of questions for God. Are you out of your mind? This is insane, etc. This is Isaac, the promised child, the long-awaited child. He's a miracle child. Well, the request is off the grid. The greatest test he ever had. This is how God deals with us. He will take the thing dearest to you, test you over it to see, do you really love me more than that? Uh, when Nathan uh, was, I think he must have been about, I don't know, six or seven years old, with his form of autism, he had uh, like a, a tactile defense disorder. So I didn't really hug him until he was around 10 years old because you couldn't because he'd scream. Uh, and so to, to go to the doctor's office to get a shot was a thing because they're going to have to touch him to give him a shot. So I remember one time we went to go give him a shot that was for his own good, uh, and we put him in the chair, and they do the rubber you know, band around the arm, and they're coming at him with a needle. They're, he wasn't freaking out because of the needle. He's freaking out because they're touching him. It was like an electric shock to his body. And so the, the doctor told me, he said, you know, Mr. Baker, we're not going to be able to hold him in that chair. Would you hold him in that chair? Hard thing to do as a dad, to hold a child in a chair for something I know he needs while he's screaming wanting out of that chair. I mean, it like breaks your heart because he didn't understand because of autism. I can't even comprehend if God said, but I want you to give up that son because you want to protect that son. That's what he wants. God will take the thing closest to you to teach you to really follow him. Uh, years ago when I found out uh, about Nathan's special needs, I was about 27, Liz was 25, uh, and I was struggling with, he'll, he won't play baseball, you know, I, he, I can't teach him a language, you know, math will be tough, blah, blah, blah. I was reading a book by Tozer, A.W. Tozer, and in the book he said this, and I, and I quote it, God cannot use you greatly unless he hurts you deeply. God cannot use you greatly until he hurts you deeply. That is how God operates. He breaks the heart, he shows you yourself, and he really comes to you to say, do you really love mother, father more than me? Or do you love me? He does the same thing with, with Isaac, to, to deepen the faith of Abraham. The response is the majority of the passage, which in Bible study methods, this would be called the law of proportion, is the main chunk of the story, verses 3 to 14. It says uh, a lot about what Abraham does. He doesn't argue with God. He does exactly what God asks him to do. Uh, it tells us his faith was so great that in Hebrews 11, uh, the Hall of Fame chapter, verse 17, it tells you how great his faith was. Here's what it says. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, uh, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, as insane as that was, man of faith. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead. That's why he did it. He so trusted God, he said, God, if you are asking me to do that which is beyond my comprehension as a father, I so trust your power that even if I follow through on this, I firmly believe that you who give life can give life again. That's some kind of faith. You're willing to follow God to do the hard thing, the difficult thing? He was willing to give up his very best for God. Are you willing to give up your very best for God? Because God will take those things you hold, uh, hold tightly to and he will open your grip through testing to say, God, no, they're really yours anyway. It says in verse three, Abraham rose early in the morning because that's what old people do, right? I'm just saying. The older you get, the less you sleep. Isn't it true? He, he rose up early in the morning. Why? Because he'd probably been up all night. He probably only slept two, three hours a night. He got up early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he, Abraham, at 100, split wood. This is a tough guy. And he did it for the burnt offering. And he rose and he went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, because it took three days to ride there from where they were, Abraham raised up his eyes and he saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young man, the servants, Notice, this is amazing what he says. Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder. And notice the, the personal pronoun. Who's coming back? We, me and my son. He knows what he's going there for. He has such faith in God that he's, this is his resurrection motif coming out. That I know what I'm being called to do, and even if I have, God calls me to follow through, I know it's a we situation coming back. That's amazing faith. Verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. He laid it on Isaac, his son, and they, they took it uh, in his hand, the fire and the knife. And so the two of them walked together looking for, where do, God, do you want us to build the altar? They're walking around on the Mount Moriah looking for the altar. Verse 7, Isaac asked a logical question, which any son would. 
who had seen his dad offer sacrifice to God before. Isaac spoke to Abraham, to his father, and he said, my father, uh, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb? Wouldn't you ask the same question? You know, dad, we've done this before. I mean, I know the drill. We always have a lamb. We build the altar. We know God wants sacrifice to cover sin. I get it. You know, it's a burnt offering. I'm kind of looking around. I'm not seeing a lamb. Uh, Dad, where's the lamb? Does his dad answer him? Verse 8. No. Verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. He didn't tell him. Then in verse 9, it says, They came to the place on Mount Moriah, which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, and he arranged the wood, comma. And then what happened? Well, then he bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. What's missing there? What's missing between the word wood and the comma and the word and? A conversation between a dad and his son. It's not in there. But it must have gone well because the son Isaac, when he's told by his dad, you know, the reason why there's not a lamb here? Because, son, you're the lamb. And Isaac must have heard his dad and said, if that's what God wants, I, as your only begotten son, will willingly lay my life down if that's what God wants. No argument from two great men of faith. Amazing. Isaac's part was uh, faithful just like, like his dad's life was faithful. Verse 10, it says, Abraham stretched out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. At that precise moment, God looked down from heaven and knew well, who Abraham really loved. He loved God more than a child. That God had his heart completely. Then there's the revelation at that precise moment. It says in verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. How close is heaven? That close. That God from his dimension just calls his name, calls his name. It says, Abraham, Abraham. He probably had to say it twice. He's a hundred. <laughs> I'm just saying, these are my contextual observations. And he said what he said before, what'd he say? Here I am. I mean, isn't God like omnipotent, you know, omniscient? You know, couldn't he said, God, why don't you, you know where I'm standing? He goes, Lord, I'm right here. I haven't moved. I'm on Mount Moriah. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing for him. Why? Notice the causal clause. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. It's not like you had a backup son or two. You gave me all that you had. The angel says, stop. Is this just any old angel? Well, you know, they're arranged in rank like a military from generals on down. And the devil used to be the head cherubim. He defected. So Michael and Gabriel swooped in. They now control this. And there's, you know, colonels. And no. Is this any old angel? No. No. This is not any old angel. This is the angel of the Lord. Remember I told you the difference between definite and indefinite articles? So this is, which one of those? Indefinite or definite? Indefinite. This is definite. It's not an angel, like a one, in a, you know, this is one of many. This is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. Who is that? It's God. It's God. Which part of the Trinity is this? It's Jesus. This is amazing. A father is laying life down the life of his only begotten son, and the one who appears to stop it is Jesus who will one day follow his father to lay his life down on another hill at another time and really be sacrificed for sin. That's amazing. Jesus stops it. How do we know that this is Jesus? Well, uh, the the angel of Jehovah, if you read through the Old Testament, uh, is is called Jehovah. Uh, It vacillates back and forth between uh, the angel of the Lord and Jehovah because he is the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. Uh, when you read Zechariah uh, 1, chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, you will see an instance of the angel of the Lord uh, communicating with the Lord, so the Trinity is talking among themselves. You must also understand that when you get to the New Testament, the phrase, the angel of the Lord, completely drops out of the terminology of the New Testament. Why? Because he's here. That's Christ. It's Christ. Christ stops the sacrifice and tells him, you have done well in the test. It says in verse 13, Abraham raised up his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him a ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered him for a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide as it is to this day in the mound of the Lord. He will provide. God did provide. He said, I'm going to 
I'm going to give you a ram. Did that little ram just happen to be there? No. As much as the God controlled that, that fish for Jonah, God said that little ram that day is going to have to meander around there and get lost right there at the right time so he can be sacrificed in, in, in the place of Isaac. The reward is God rewards him greatly. Verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and says to him, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Now the angel is talking as if he's the Lord because he is the Lord. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you. I will multiply your seed greatly as the stars of the heavens. Everything I promised you shall now be yours as, as what I said in the Abrahamic covenant. What's the story's instruction? Much I mean, think about the topology of the whole thing. A son follows the will of his father to lay his life down based on the direction of the father. You cannot go through the book of, the, of John, the gospel of John, and not see throughout the entire book like a beautiful thread, the words coming from the mouth of Christ, I came to do the will of he who sent me. Sent. That word, it appears all throughout John. John. All the time from the mouth of Christ. Why? Because he left the glory of heaven based on the will of the Father to come do the will of the Father to be the sacrifice. And think about this. As the two men, uh, Abraham and his son Isaac, carried wood for sacrifice, well, the greater Isaac, Jesus, is going to come and not just carry wood. He's going to carry a wooden cross. And he's going to take that wooden cross and be crucified on it for the sin of the world as the perfect Lamb of God as the perfect ram of God because the ram was used for burnt offerings as well to cover sins of trespass, sins, the heinous sins. He's going to become that sacrifice. Where was Mount Moriah? Well, it's just some mountain somewhere in Israel. I mean, who knows? We know exactly where it was. Mount Moriah, not by accident they went there. Second Chronicles, uh, chapter 3, your favorite book of the Old Testament. Chapter 3, Chronicles. It says, then Solomon said in verse 1, began to build the house of the Lord, the temple, in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornam the Jebusite. Where did they take the sacrifice? Where was Abraham and Isaac? Same location. Same location. Where's Mount Moriah? In Jerusalem, where they built the temple. See, years before, a thousand years before the Christ is going to lay his life down, Abraham is doing this typological thing to point forward to the Christ. In the same location, it's where the temple was going to be. Then after the time of uh, Solomon, a thousand years after that, in 5 BC is the arrival of the Christ who would carry the cross, who would go to this place and his, the final week of his life would be put on trial there and then crucified outside the city gate. Why was there a ram there? Well, the ram was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant and the ram was the sign of the greater ram, Jesus, who would come. So that little ram could be there in the stable looking over there at that little baby in the manger and if the, if the ram could speak, what would he say? Hey, I totally understand why I'm in this stable. Do you understand? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to study about the little ram, theologically the import of his message to us. Uh, we who know you, thank you for the fact that the story of Abraham and Isaac is really uh, an amazing story uh, of your love for us and your desire to make us into your image. But it teaches us about the greatness of the coming of the Messiah uh, and that you laid his life down and he was willing to lay his life down. How could we not love him? Thank you for the fact that that's the Christmas story, you giving us your only begotten son. Might we who know you share the gospel story with those who need to know a Savior has come. And those among us who don't know you, might this be the Christmas, they bow their knee before you and say, Lord, uh, save me and you shall do that. We thank you, we worship you in your holy name. Amen.